Can I get the next question from the audience, please? Hi, um, to the panel, um, what sort of steps need to be taken to establish a wildlife refuge, both economically and politically? Would you like to start? I don't know. Okay. When you just when you when you're gonna protect any piece of open space, whether it be a national wildlife refuge, maybe a local piece of open space, national park, but particularly when you're doing something that's at the national level, you really have to have a grassroots effort and then build it. I think they talked about the Murrays who really had the vision and you have to have the people who have the vision and the passion to really make sure um, it, you see it through. But part of that is also making sure that your elected officials, that the people that you elect understand how important this is to you. And most of you probably know that we had a president, Theodore Roosevelt, who had a vision for conservation. And his passion established something like 150 um, national forests, the National Wildlife Refuge System, 51 national parks. He basically protected our country from just losing all of these resources. So it's really interesting that we need to have both the champions in terms of the volunteers and the citizenry but we also have to use our power at the election booth to say, these are the people we want elected who are going to do what needs to be done and have the vision that even if it's the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, a place that some of us may never get to visit, haven't probably visited yet, but the fact is, is that how do, we, how do we protect that and keep it pristine? How do we have that vision for places like that? but also for places like here in, in Connecticut. And I'll just tell you, it was really interesting when Calf Island became part of the National Wildlife Refuge here in Connecticut, because when we added that small 27-acre island to the National Wildlife Refuge, there were a lot of people in Greenwich who didn't want, want to have that, because what they said is, well, we don't want the federal government controlling our island. We won't have access anymore. And so that's where we have to balance, and we, and we really had a battle in our community about that that you may or may not have been aware of. The interesting thing, we were trying to protect three pieces of open space at that time. People in our community were interested in open space. We were protecting that island. We were protecting the Pomerantz Tuckman property, which is a, a piece that the town ended up purchasing. And we were also protecting a piece in the Mianus River called Treetops. That we, 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 what we did was we put a, co a coalition. We ended up protecting in, in that year three large parcels of property. One was purchased by the state of Connecticut, one was purchased by the town, and the third p parcel was purchased by the federal government to be part of this National Wildlife Refuge System. So we had these local advocates who got together and said, we have three pieces of open space that all are coming up on the market for sale. How do we protect them? So you really need to have that vision. and, and if you think that you can't make a difference, you can make a difference because it's all grassroots. It's all local. These things don't happen because somebody up in the federal office in Washington say we need a national wildlife refuge. It happens at the grassroots level. Thank you. Uh, can we get another question from the audience? Considering what you said that how it's mostly focused on a grassroots kind of uh, base, do you think that the cause will be tainted at, by going to a national level or would it be further uh, exponential, like would it increase exponentially like in support or like regarding the matter? I'm not exactly sure of your question, so hopefully I'll answer. Basically, are you suggesting that if a parcel becomes part of a federal program versus a local program? I think when you elevate a parcel of land to the federal program, it's like, what's its importance? And one of the reasons that Calf Island was so important is because of its part of the Atlantic Flyway. It's not just a parcel by itself. So unlike, for example, the Pomerantz Tuckman property that the town purchased, it's a piece of open space that we use as a park, but it probably doesn't have uh, significance on a national level in terms of the national folks coming in and protecting it. 
But Calf Island did have that national importance and international importance because the Atlantic Flyway is, a, is internationally known for the migratory birds that utilize that island. So that's where sometimes we have to have these pieces and we were talking previously that it's not enough just to save the national wildlife refuges that are the big ones if we don't um, save the, the migration path in between. So if we don't have these stopover places for the birds, we can have a national wildlife ish, you know, refuge someplace else that's this big one that everybody loves, but if the birds can't get there, we're gonna lose, part, we're gonna lose that population and the importance. Can I get a question possibly from this side of the room? Somebody? <laughs> We've heard two from here. Okay. Thank you. Um, with regard to the fact that we have now become a very global uh, community, how do we protect the corridors for the wildlife? The corridors, I mean, that's a big part. I mean, right now we're having a problem in the Northeast with coyotes because we basically gotten rid of the original predator that was here and we have this new organism that's come in because we've looked at the genetic um, um, makeup of these organisms to find out where these coyotes have come from and they too are being pushed out so my question is is if we're, we are identifying a very spe specific spot animals don't see those boundaries what do we do? Um, Andy? It, it's such a great question you know I've written a lot about global uh, stresses on ecosystems that transcend boundaries and virtually all the stressors transcend boundaries and sometimes by the way they're not it, it can be something that we're buying that's affecting an ecosystem Absolutely. in in uh, South America or sub-Saharan Africa so there's those indirect forces as well the bottom line seems to be for most systems if you give them some space and you and you keep in mind as you're developing a strategy for conserving uh, not just a species but but a dynamic ecological system um, there's ways to plan and, and to look at relationships and when you're building a highway system making sure there's ways for critters to go under and over it um, and that's j just as true locally as it is globally because things move and right now especially in the Arctic um, ecosystems are in a state of powerful flux because of the warming climate uh, there, are, there are a lot of areas right now that are just sort of tiny little tundra where, where a willow tree is this big <laughs> that a hundred years from now will probably have real you know big willow trees and so being aware of the, the need to have a certain plasticity, the ability to, for ecosystems to have some space and capacity to move. Coral reefs right now, the same deal. Uh, they're finding that, that around the Barrier Reef in Australia that corals are, are moving. They're actually starting to settle in what used to be colder waters at the south end of that system, even as some of the hotter areas are stressing because of too much heat. So just making sure this capacity to give them the space uh, and sometimes spaces, I don't just mean space, physical space, but some ecological space to, to, to move is important. Now, and again, there's this debate among, um, even among biologists right now over what your goals should be. Uh, our parks, I went down to the Everglades a few years ago to write about these Burmese, Bur Burmese pythons that are invading the Everglades. They were brought into Florida by pet owners. I don't know if anyone here has a boa constrictor. Or a, you, can, you don't have to admit it if you do. But, you know, there are a lot of weird animals that were moving around just for the pet, pet trade. Uh, lionfish, another example, moved by the pet trade, and now they're moving through the Caribbean, even up to Long Island Sound. <laughs> they're going to be the, yeah, you, you, oh my God. You have one here, or? Oh, good. You should eat it. <laughs> no, go to my website, and there's a list of 100 recipes for lionfish. You have to be really careful. <laughs> anyway, I mean, at the, so what I'm saying is that the same, under our history of the park system, the National Park Service biologists in the Everglades under the law are supposed to keep these guys out, and there's just no way. It's there for the long haul. So what do you do now? You have to sort of be a little more like judo and less like karate in, in the sense of they're there now, do what you can to control them, but, but with a certain sense of flexibility. We can't control everything, and we're mashing up ecosystems in so many ways that getting comfortable with the reality that things are going to change is another aspect of what has to happen. Anybody else want to respond on that? Or next question? <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, this uh, great land, they call themselves, they're thinking about connecting all these protected areas somehow or another over the highway or something, strip a land over it so the animal could have free to move around. 
make a passes for them to another protected area. Maybe that might do it. I don't know. <laughs>